Hello and welcome to the Hard Questions. I'm Solomon Serwanja. On the 9th of August, the World Bank published on their website that they had suspended public financing to Uganda. Just last financial year, the World Bank pumped about $5.2 billion into development projects. The president has reacted strongly, saying that the country Uganda will continue to develop with or without loans. The latest reaction is from the Deputy Speaker of Parliament, who said that they passed the law knowing that there will be consequences. Before the World Bank's decision, a number of civil society organizations had camped up calling for the World Bank to take action against the law that was passed. What are the implications? Is it going to be tough this financial year? I'm really delighted to be hosting Julius Mukunda, the executive director of CS Bank, on the show today to break it down for us. Julius, thank you so much for accepting to speak to us. Thank you. Julius, let's start off with the issue of the World Bank's decision to stop public financing. What does it mean? I mean, the issue, the, the, it means that you have one good, rich friend who has been giving you loans at a concessional rate, and he has decided to put a rug under your feet. So definitely, there is going to be very big challenge for government to finance its budget. Mm. Because this person has been contributing the biggest share of your multilateral credit. Half of our multilateral credit is actually being financed by the World Bank. As such, government at this particular moment must try whatever possible it is to do two things. Either you win back the World Bank or you cut down your appetite to spend. Let's talk about winning back the World Bank. Um, we have already seen statements that are coming through from top government officials, including the president, saying, in, 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 in lack of a better word, and allow me to quote this, he said, it is therefore unfortunate that the World Bank and other actors dare to want to coerce us into abandoning our faith, culture, principles, and sovereignty using money. They really underestimated all Africans. And he said, and I quote, if there is absolute need for borrowing, Uganda will turn to a number of non Bretton Wood sources, so to speak. Looks like the president here is saying, you cannot undermine our sovereignty because you're giving us money. We can look elsewhere. I, I mean, let, let's deal with the facts. I, I, read, I read want sometimes to deal with some, the facts. The, the fact number one is that we are, we are a country, we are a sovereign nation. That's true. Number two is that we are not in isolation. We don't live on an island. And I have given an example. Right now, Kenya is a sovereign nation. It cannot make a law to stop the transit of goods and services to Uganda. It cannot, but it's a sovereign country. Why? Because if it does that, there would be reaction. The same way Uganda cannot pass a law to say we, are, we don't want to transit goods and services to Congo to pass through our country. Mm -hmm. No, we are a sovereign country, we can do that. But we can't, because every reaction has got an action. And this is the same thing that is happening. That whatever we do as in, in the name of our, as a sovereign nation, we should be prepared for the action, for the consequences of our action. And this is what has happened. That the consequences of the, what we have done has resulted in one of our donors uh, development partner pulling out. Does that mean that the development partner should force us to do the things that they want? I don't think at this particular moment it is. What it requires is that you need a consultation to say, this is, this is what I'm planning to do, but I need to consult widely the people who are likely to be affected. That's what is, is in this modern era. You don't see it and singularly decide on a decision that has got a ripple effect. So government of Uganda, and they, have also, they also know that, that the current legislation they did has got some loopholes. 
Even the president has said that. And as such, it is important to sit with those who are affected to see how they can be helped. But to sit here and say, for us, we can do without you. I have been looking through the list of world countries, those that don't borrow money. I can tell you it is one or two. The rest of the total Uganda, of the world countries must survive on loans. Unless our leaders have got a miracle somewhere on how we are going to survive without borrowing, then I can agree with them. But at this particular moment, I don't see anything on the table that we will actually outmaneuver this. The only thing they are telling us is that we will survive. And, and, and so let me tell you, I no longer want to survive. Why? Because for the last, since independence, I've been surviving on one meal a day. An ordinary person has been surviving one meal a day. An ordinary person who goes to, to, to hospital, he does not get full medication, half medication, because stock costs are very high. Our ordinary person has been surviving in the public schools, where quality of education is extremely very poor. An ordinary person is the one who, I mean, potholes are everywhere. If you are, you are in Kampara, you want to, to drive from, from here to, to town, I mean, it should take you 10 minutes. It takes you half an hour. So we've been surviving. So when they say we shall survive, I don't understand what they do. We no longer want to survive. We want to thrive this time around. And we believe that this tendency of saying we survive, we survive, is only, is only being advanced by people who are actually thriving. Because they are saying we shall survive, but their children are in private schools. They say we shall survive, when they fall sick, they go to Nairobi. But the World Bank is not building private hospitals, it's been building public, uh, uh, public hospitals, regional hospitals. None of these people is going to these regional hospitals. None of these people is using the boreholes that we are building in this country. None of these people is taking their children to, to, to UPE schools. And they are the same people saying that we shall survive. Hell no. We, we, that rhetoric must stop, get on board, so that Ugandans can thrive. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that also speaks into the budget. We just passed about a budget of 52 trillion shillings, and part of it is going to be financed by, you know, concession loans such as those from the World Bank. We cannot absolutely know how much has been budgeted for in concessional support from the World Bank, but just in the last financial year, the World Bank pumped about $5.2 billion in different projects, including those in health, and in education. That's quite a big, big gap uh, in case there's, this suspension is not halted. How are we going to survive? How, how are we going to bridge that deficit? We can even make it simpler and say that out of 52 trillion, 0.7, we are only going to raise 29.9 trillion. So basically- Internally, from internally, the Royal Authority. Authority. So basically, you are talking of more than 45% of the budget is going to be foreign financing. Now, I, an ordinary person needs to understand when we say do, foreign financing. Foreign financing is in two ways. There is consensual and non-consensual. Now, World Bank is under consensual. When we say consensual, we can say commercial and non-commercial. So World Bank is non-commercial. So when we say non-commercial, it means that these are loans you get that are below 1% interest rate, the payment period is more than 40 years, and the grace period under which you are required to start paying is 10 years to come. So you have all the time to make your investments, generate returns, and start paying back the loan. That's where our bank is. On top of providing grants, that is yeah. the money they have given you, that you will not pay back. Yeah. In fact, the current 30 acting, active projects of World Bank amount to 9.5 billion United States dollars. Wow. Out of that, 179 million US dollars is meant as grant. So I just, I just want you to understand that. Now compare that to a non-concessional loan, a commercial loan. A commercial loan comes to government 
at an interest above 6 to 15 percent depending on whom you have, you have negotiated with mm -hmm. grace period is two years or even one year arrangement fees over one one percent over the total of the total uh, co of the total uh, mm -hmm. loan that, yeah. you, that, that, that you have got payment period is not more than 10 years now to drive it home if you have a project of three years and luckily you finish it in five years my friend before you finish the project you have already started paying back the loan before you finish the project you've already started paying back the loan so i just want another person to understand the consequence of that that even before the project generates its own revenue, its own returns. You've started picking from your consul from Uganda Revenue Authority collections to pay back the loan. That's how bad it is. And that's how I want our policymakers to understand it. That before we sit to make decisions, we need to understand how to prevent these, some of these negative actions. Because we can say we're a sovereign country, we make our own rules, but let them know that when the rubber hits the road, these are the things that are going to start happening in this country. You've really painted it quite so well because then we have to look elsewhere to cover that gap. And that, like you said, we are going to do a lot of internal borrowing from commercial banks. The president seems to suggest that there are other borrowing options from out of the Bre uh, Bretton Woods uh, Team. So he's looking at the Exim Bank of China, the Chinese, the, uh, the, the, the Islamic Bank, and all these other uh, to get money that they would have gotten from the World Bank. Is that a viable option? Again, I, I live with, with reality, Solomon. Let's say we want to go to the, we want, we want to, go to the Chinese. Chinese money is non consensual it's among the commercial loans that we get. The interest rates between hovering between 3% to 5%. Their payment period is within 10 years. They, are, they have commitment fees, they have arrangement fees, all these things. So that's a commercial, a commercial loan. Why are we leaving a concessional loan to a commercial loan? That's number one. Let it say that, of course, they have provided. The possibility of getting money from the Chinese now is even more difficult. Why do I say that? Because we've, for the last 10 years, we've been begging them to give us money for the SGR. They have not given us that particular money. Why? Because they have their own issues and interests. In Tebe Airport, we have not finished it. That was an exim bank loan. Simply because we made a few errors in its process and they halted the funding. So, Chinese is an area I wouldn't want to go to. The other option the people have said is to go to the Islamic Bank. Islamic Bank has been here for the last 60 years. Why have we not used it then? Why are we saying we can now use it right now? Because they have their own interest. Probably the interest that we are not likely even to, 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 uh, to, 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 to fulfill. Don't think that we go to World Bank because uh, there are other alternatives. No, it's because their money is the best to use because of what I have just explained. Yeah. Some people have said, we go to Russia. Please go to Russia. If Russia can give you money in the middle of a war. Right now, the priorities of Russia are completely different than what we need at this particular moment. Really, it's, it, you are going to an injured person to seek for more help. That is very embarrassing. We should actually be helping them instead so they can get out of this crisis and the world gets back to normal. People have said, let's go to the BRICS. 40 countries are lining up to join the BRICS and none of them has succeeded. Why do you think it is happening? Because they don't want you to bring problems of the other, of the other economic, uh, economic uh, blocks and you bring them into BRICS. They are very careful in terms of what they are doing. Why is that they have not, for the last five years, they have not ab ab uh, accepted any person to be a member. The other option is we should borrow domestically. 
And that is my fear because that is the only option we have. To cover the deficit of the World Bank is to raid Bank of Uganda and our commercial banks down the streets. So what does that mean to a country that has got a development, uh, a, a private sector development program, specifically for revamping the private sector so that they can lead our growth agenda? It won't because you are going to suck up all the money from the commercial banks. The interest rates are going to shoot up. Private sector uh, will not be able to access the credit. It's going to be very expensive. But my fears are also too, is that non-performing loan portfolio is going to shoot up because companies will not be able to service their loans because the interest rates are going to go up. And when that happens, you are sucking in the financial, institute, the financial institutions because no bank is going to have a huge non-performing loan portfolio on its books. They would be analyzed by Bank of Uganda. So it is just a web of so many problems that will require us to take a very painful decision, go back to our bank and negotiate to see that this situation gets out of hand. Otherwise, considering our past experience in managing public resources, I don't think at this particular moment there is any viable option for us that we can get out uh, and, and work scot-free. So you, you're encouraging Uganda to cut down on its pride because if you listen from a statement that was made by the Foreign Affairs Minister, the Honorable Kelo Riem, he called them hypocrites. They're preaching democracy and yet they are also pushing down our throats what they think is good for us. From foreign affairs, you know, it's jittery out there. The president too is a little bit mad. Um, and yet you're, you're saying that one of our viable options is let's get the bank to come back and let's sit and talk through this out so that they can be able to lift that suspension. It's, you know, and just to add, the incoming president of the World Bank, World Bank, that's Banga, uh, Ajay, he was under a lot of pressure uh, from all across the world to make sure that he takes action. There are worries that other big agencies like the International Monetary Fund and you know, other big uh, agencies that give us concessional loans could follow suit. And this could deepen us further. Uh, and uh, I mean, a few, a few issues here you can also want to, to interrogate. Number one is that Uganda is among 30 other countries that have got similar kind of law. Why now? And the World Bank is working very well with these countries of the, with the uh, similar, uh, similar uh, legislation in place. So we've been asking ourselves, why now? Why is that the World Bank has come up with this as a condition? But also, you will remember very well that World Bank has been one of the liberal yeah. funding agencies. Yeah. When we had the crises of people being killed in Kasese, the tear gassing, the imprisonment, the beating up, the bank has been keeping quiet. They're like, no, these are internal affairs of your country, please sort them out. In fact, it's the EU that has really very, very persistent on human rights, on issues. Human rights issues and democracy in this country. To me, it was actually a surprise. I was shocked that the bank took this particular could this answer that question? Because there were about 170 civil society organizations that wrote a petition to the World Bank for the World Bank to act after the president signed into law. So I, Maybe it was impre increasing pressure. Probably, probably it could be that. But also I think there are some other geopolitical issues that are taking place that we are not paying attention to, Uga especially as Uganda. Because we've asked ourselves, why, why now? Because there are other bigger, Solomon, bigger human rights issues in this country than the anti-homosexuality law that has been passed. So one of them we thought about was probably is our so much friendship with China. Probably. We don't know. Is it because now there are those internal pressures to put pressure on us? Because these things happen in the countries. The countries are pushed, you know, coerced and so that you can tow a particular line. We know that happens. And you know, as Uganda, we've been standing in the middle. We neither support 
we either we either or we are, we are supporters or we are not supporters. We are just we are neutral. Is it because of our oil that is likely to come out? Because most of the deals, the Americans and Europeans really tend not to have benefited so much from these particular elements. Is, is, is it that? And that's why I'm saying for me, I believe there, is, there must be negotiation, even beyond this. There, there must be some other things beyond this. This could have been a catalyst. But nevertheless, if it is this, what is it that government can do? I don't believe at this particular moment that the government really should go back to World Bank and say, oh, now we are fine, we have withdrawn it. Because as a, as a sovereign nation, really, it is a very big embarrassment. But I believe there are some win-wins, because already we know that there are some clauses within this particular law that have been highlighted that can be negotiated. Even the president himself, he is on record saying there are certain clauses within this law that can be, uh, uh, that ca that can be worked around, can be, that can be reviewed. So I think that's for me a very good a very good starting point for us to, to begin the negotiation. Because Solomon, this is not the usual politicking. This is, this is, a, this is a do and die situation. <laughs> and I don't know why people take it so lightly. This is a do and die situation. Because if World Bank is providing money for medicines, if World Bank is providing services, if World Bank is building schools, if World Bank is rehabilitating hospitals to function, what happens when they stop? When they stop, it the means these services are not going to be there. And we are going to roll back the progress that we have done in terms of poverty, in terms of employment, in terms of nutrition status. Everything is just going to roll back. So don't tell me we are going to survive, and I agree with you. No, I will not agree with you, Solomon. The president seems to suggest that we will survive against all odds. And let me just read a quotation from him. He says, moreover, our first oil will start flowing out of the ground by 2025. That will be an additional source of state revenue and also financial flows into our economy. And he added that disciplined patriotism and combating corruption, we shall thrive because our agricultural sector is there, our industries are continuing to grow, and our service sector is expanding. So dear Ugandans, do not worry. Three things in that statement. The oil, the corruption, and the agriculture marketing. For the oil, me and you, please, let's go it down on our knees. We pray that this oil comes out. Because even without this World Bank decision, this oil must come out. If it doesn't come out, we are actually even in bigger problems than the World Bank. Because we borrowed most monies best on the oil production. The experience is that we are good at postponing the production debt. It was supposed to be in 2000, it went in 2007, it went in 2010, it was in 2013, now we are in 20, 2025. 2025. But this time maybe it's more serious because of the investment. Yes, but also because, I mean, when you look at the things that are happening, because right now ECOP has, hasn't got funding for the pipeline. But also let's say that they, say they get the pipeline, they, they get the funding today. Will they, by 2025, be able to have finished constructing the pipeline from Mohima to Tanga? It will take them three years to do that. So at this particular moment, I think, unless we work day and night, but the fact that in this country, our public investment management is extremely very low and poor. I don't have too much hope into that. But I'm, again, I'm like, can there be some miracle? People to work day and night for us to be able to have this oil out. And that's that, that, that the status of oil. And, 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 and for me, and I have told my colleagues who are against us getting oil from the ground, I, I, I think it would be very stupid of us sit on this reserve and we don't get it. The only thing is how can we get it smartly without affecting the environment. But for us, we are not going to get it. I don't think that's, for me, I don't belong to that category. The other issue is the corruption part. Because the president he says, oh, these corrupt public officials. And, 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 and I have argued again. Sometimes I think we don't have information on corruption. But even where information is, there is no action that has been taken, take, has, has, has taken place. The impunity under which we abuse the system is mind-boggling, uh, is, is, is just too much. Just 
look at the Mabati case, for example. You are a full minister having been charged for stealing iron sheets. You still remain in, you still remain a minister. Forget about those who have not been charged, but you've been charged, but you are still a minister. Because even under public service orders, the moment you are charged in a criminal court, you are put on suspension until the case is disposed of. We can't even do that small gesture in support of corruption. This country, the Auditor General has said that we've lost 2.2 trillion in the last financial year because of procurement irregularities. And the irregularities deal with getting one, uh, I mean, you, you've heard of this case of Nagri, where there is, you, you just contract one company to supply you semen, you know, uh, for artificial insemination for animals. And you, you decided to, f to forget about all the procurement rules of doing public bidding, get the best bidder, analyze, and offer the, the, offer, offer, offer the contract. On top of that, you have not even consulted the Solicitor General that actually should I go out with this. Not because you are not even educated. No, you are a doctor. Ten years experience. And we end up losing that kind of money. That is the level. The, the other part of, 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 of corruption is we plan for it. We budget for it. We take it to Parliament for appropriation. And after that, we begin executing it. It is illegal, but very awful. You, you, go to, you go, you plan and say, I need a car. A car of, 10, of 100 million, you cost it 500 million. You put it in the plan, you budget for it, it is approved by parliament, and you go and buy a car of 500 million. And the car is of 100 million. We've lost 400 million. But in a, a, legal, a legal process, that's what I'm telling you. So that's, what, that's how we lose it. So, you, you go and ask and you find somebody, the same supplier, supplying different government departments, different prices. And you ask yourself, what's wrong with this government? And we're delivering as one. So that's how corruption is in this country. And, and until the president really comes out to rain on these things, we will continue uh, losing this money. The president says our agriculture has come up. Yes, our agriculture has come up. And that's the level that we are going to come up. We are not going to go beyond that. Why? Because... Even as World Bank was giving us money to add value to our products, yeah. you see, which we are not doing because we would borrow money to add value to our, our products, that we can now turn maize into flour, into cornflakes. Yeah. We can have pasteurized eggs. Uh, we can have powdered sweet potatoes or dried for purposes of export. The World Bank is not going to do that. But even when we do that, we don't have market for our grocery products. And it's not because the markets are not there. It's, not, it's because we've not prepared our farmers to produce for the market. Yeah. So it's just interesting, uh, Julius, what you're saying. Because this is what the president was trying to look at in terms of fallback to sort of bridge it. But he also speaks about discipline. And I wanted to, to, to really engage on the issue of waste, of expenditure, wasteful expenditure. Um, it could be seen as one of the ways we can try to save up on on, 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 on the money so that we can try to cover this, at least for this financial year. So in a short term, because yes, there's short term and long term measures. Let's talk about public wasteful expenditure. And I know that CSBAC has published several reports on this. How can we cut out, how, how are some of the ways, what are some of the ways that the public, the, the people in government, in top officials, top officials of government and those in government, are uh, wasting public resources in terms of different implementation of different infrastructure projects and other projects? Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that you have also asked this question because, I mean, I, I can actually see a number of government officials share the same, the same view that we are wasting resources. I think the challenge is how do we rain on that? How do we stop it? Wasting government resources in this country is, uh, is shocking. First of all, we don't know the number of vehicles we have in this country. If Solomon, you can tell me the number of vehicles this country has, please. I know ministries with so many cars, Ministry of Health, 
the ministry of water they don't have the, ministry the number of works. cars that they have that tells you the level of wastage because you'll find cars in garages you'll find cars in people's uh, homes you find cars parked at police you'll find cars parked at ministry headquarters at the districts and wherever you find cars parked in villages in an abandoned health center. A car is parked there. That's the level of wastage. And some of these cars is because probably it lacks a tire, it lacks a spark plug, and you just abandon it and plan to buy a new car. That is the level of wastage. So we are telling government, because you see so many we are coming to this office, the office does not give you a car. But you come. That we tell government, top up 200,000 shillings on each, on each civil servant. Tell them to come to office. Stop buying vehicles. Vehicles should only people who are, who are a security threat to the country. Like a chief justice, the president, the, the speaker, only those. The rest, let everybody come to office you would save a cost half a trillion on that amount and sell everything. So to deal with World Bank problem immediately, that's the first thing we need to do. You'll be faced with a, a very strong resistance. And, and let me tell you, of course, there, and that's what I'm saying, that it is not for the faint-hearted. And I'm, I'm, that's what I'm saying, that why I'm insisting that the government should go back and negotiate. I am not seeing anybody in the government with the capacity to make such a decision. Because that's what is needed to be able to counteract the Bank of Uganda action. The second one is rationalize. Rationalize, not agencies, everything in the government. Do you need 180 presidential advisors in this country? Do we need plus 80, plus 80 ministers and state ministers? Do we need minist their ministries? I just don't understand what they do. Like, they are supposed to be a department. Minister of Science and Technology. That's supposed to be a department and the Minister of Education. Or a department and uh, Minister of Communication and, <laughs> and Guidance, I think. It's supposed to be a department, a specialized department of science and technology. You don't need a minister to run that ministry. Do you need a minister for Karamoja, for Bunyoro, for Toro, for Bugisu? Probably even for me, for Murukunji, I should advocate for a minister for Murukunji. You don't need all that. Those are supposed to be different departments under a particular ministry. So you rationalize that. And I have told, I have given another example. You have Public Service Commission, Education Service Commission, Health Service Commission, Judicial Service Commission. All of them are recruiting public servants. Do you need all of that? Recently, I saw a number of examination boards. You name, there is a manya. So, like, there are five examination boards. I was asking myself, so what is the Uganda National Examination Board? What does it do if it cannot administer examinations in this country? So you need that one. Again, Solomon, between me and you, who takes that decision? Who has the capacity to take that decision to counteract the uh, 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 World, Bank, World Bank move? You have all these members of parliament. Over 530. Uganda, we are overrepresented. You have a parliament, you have a district council, you have a sub county council, you have a village council, you have a parish council. You have a women's council, you have elders council, you have a youth council, you have... I, I just don't know what we are doing, spending money on all these areas. Recently, the Electoral Commission produced a roadmap of 1.3 trillion Ugandan shillings. So you can imagine, that is where we need to start from. So as a country, I can agree that actually we can be better without World Bank if we have the capacity to do these particular areas and stop the hemorrhage in our financial system. That one, we can do it. But if at this particular moment we don't have anybody to do that, please don't tell me to survive. I need to progress to make sure that tomorrow I have the next meal on my plate. 
Wow. It's going to be tough. Already when the president talked about, you know, closing down some agencies and integrated them, integrating them into ministries, you saw the fight that happened at different levels, you know, uh, you know, removing, for example, the rural electrification agency and merging it um, at the Ministry of Energy. It was, uh, there was, I mean... No, they uh, tried it once and everybody rallied to support rural electrification agency not to go. So that, because if it successfully goes, it would mean others can also go. Exactly. I know that UNRWA has been putting up a fight. I don't know if they have finally been reintegrated into the Ministry of Works. There's been all these different fights, so I don't know if that proposal can... So that, that's the hemorrhage we're talking about, that people are holding on to their turf, that we can't, we can't live without it. And, and we are telling them that if you want to stay like that, then... Go back and beg. Go back and beg. But you don't, you don't tell us that you're not going to beg, and at the same time, you want to still remain with what you have. No, you can't have your cake and at the same time eat it. But, but, but some I think, even without the World Bank ban, this is what a normal country does. Mm -hmm. Stop wastage of public resources. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't do that, I mean, again, I mean, and I agree, I agree, I think, with, uh, I think, Honorable Anita. He said, this business of getting cheap loans has made us lazy. And I think probably it is also true. Because you have is a way of getting money, why should you want to start suffering? But for a country to prosper, you use the aid to help you progress, to be at a particular level. And to be at a particular level, you must work to be economically independent. So that time comes when you can decide on your development agenda. But you can't say, I want a development agenda, but at the same time I want to beg. Therefore, there, there will be some conflict in terms of where I want to go. Yeah. Um, Julius, as we wrap up, um, the, there is a quote um, from Godbert Mushabe who says that Uganda as a country cannot do without foreign lending, uh, given the fact that we have a very extravagant government. That's a quote, but he said. But I just wanted to engage your mind on how does this financial year look like? Cast me a spotlight with all these challenges that, are, that, is, that the economy is facing, you know, the, the suspension of, of, of the funding from the World Bank, how is this financial year going to be, especially after passing 52 trillion shillings? How is it going to be? Should we hold tight and, you know, project for me? My, projected, my projection without the World Bank was a positive one. And let me tell you why. Because as a, as a country, first is that when you have enough food in the country, when you have the ability to grow food in the country, mm. a number of fundamentals are sorted out. Because you see, a hungry population becomes very rowdy. Crime increases, productivity reduces, ailments and sickness increases, dropout rates. So a number of your indicators really go down, down the hill. But when you have food, there is how you maintain that. That's why I was challenging finance and the Bank of Uganda, is that you overcooked the economy with the policies. We would have left things to remain there they are until we have enough production of food. Inflation would have come down. That's why now inflation is even far, far beyond, uh, below the target of 5%. Now we are at 36 In fact, I was telling them, please do something, because you overcooked the economy. So without the World Bank ban, we are really holding on to a, a positive trajectory. But with this World Bank ban, it means now we have to go back to the drawing board because the investments we want to make are going to, to delay. Oh, by the way, you see, people are saying that the World Bank mentioned only projects in the pipeline. But there is a statement in the World Bank statement that it, that it made that even the current ongoing project will attract increased scrutiny. Yeah. Now, so between me and you, when we say increased scrutiny on Uganda, we are in trouble because we are not doing well in terms of managing these projects of the World Bank. It has been lenient. You achieve below 5%, they say, okay, please make sure next time you do it. But if there is increased scrutiny, it means that even the disbursement rate is going to reduce because we are likely not to perform at 100%.
So with the World Bank ban now, you begin to see that our trajectory, probably the 6.4% growth we are talking about, mm -hmm. we might not achieve it. We are going to have a delay in delivering services because we don't have cash, enough cash. FDI, which Bank of Uganda has been relying on to use in, in control in its monetary policy, is going to reduce. There is a likelihood that even foreign investors who have been here on the banking that the World Bank is giving us the money are likely to start moving out. Inflation, uh, the shearing stability is put into question, as you see last year. We low, a low time low of 1.6% uh, uh, depreciation of the Ghanaian shilling. But ab above all is, is that we fear, we, we just pray that there is no, uh, that the EU won't follow, or other funders won't follow the World Bank uh, decision. And that is the worst case scenario that probably we don't wish to happen. So that's sort of in my case. As, as government of Uganda, let's call back our friend who has been with us since independence to come back and put, go to the negotiation table and talk on how we can resolve this crisis. It's an issue of sovereignty. Yes. I, I, you see, the issue of sovereignty, I don't know, because we have contracts in this country where our, our sovereignty has been waived off. Most contracts we sign with the Chinese, with any other commercial uh, loan provider, our sovereignty as a country has been waived off. It means that the government of Uganda cannot claim sovereignty when they are executing that particular contract. I wonder why this time we are speaking about sovereignty when actually in all other contracts it is not there. So sometimes there are double standards. So, and, and from that, so I, 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 I tell you, let's deal with the situation as it is. Forget about having egos, forget about being sovereignty and being, uh, you know, we are on our own. Let us deal with the situation knowing that at the end of the day, the ordinary person needs food on the table. He doesn't want to tell you that we are a sovereign country. All right. Julius Mukunda, thank you so much for speaking to us. A pleasure being with him. Well, I've been speaking uh, with uh, Julius Mukunda, who is the executive director of CSBAG, breaking down for us what it means when the World Bank actually suspended its public financing to Uganda. And uh, to be honest, from what he's said, we need to hold tight on what the future looks like. I'm Solomon Serwanja. Thank you for watching The Hard Questions. Until next time, have a great one.